Thank you for the opportunity. And I first want, would like to start by thanking uh, Professor Finizio for inviting me over and over the, again, over the years. I think this is our fourth or fourth time, I think, that I'm uh, here with you, uh, the, the, the students of the University of Torino. And each time I see the, the lecture, I always tell my colleagues when I go back to Turkey how uh, you know deep and uh, sophisticated the students, the level of knowledge of the students were, and how they were interested in in a topic uh, which is not uh, maybe the most interesting topic uh, at the moment. Um, so I'm really but grateful to Giovanni to you know have us um, together. I will be uh, uh, talking today about uh, a very you know I would say uh, state of relations which you may call as in a coma or ghost like relationship or in a uh, in a state of um, sclerosis. You know you, you may call it whatever you want. And,
European Union was holding and uh, so uh, from a strategic perspective it also included a normative perspective and then it developed the neighborhood policies and uh, it, you know, this ring is somehow enlarging. And Turkey, as you see in the map, still in grey uh, color, not uh, in yellow, the blue one, um, is actually, um, as I said before, has been uh, officially uh, applied and officially started the process of application of accession back in 1959. Okay, and this is a particular time because it's so early. You know, it was. When you look at the signature of the Rome Treaties, it's in 1957. So you can see that Turkey was very eager to become a member of, or a part of this European integration due to several reasons um, on the domestic front. Um, so we see that um, these relations, which started almost 63 years ago, um, uh, formally and officially, and in a very optimistic, you know, setup. How did it become um, to the current state? Why did Turkey disappear from the agenda of the European Union? And why did the European Union disappear from the agenda of Turkey, despite the efforts of integration or accession? Uh, during the course of these 63 years, you know, it's a very long period, and it has, uh, uh, you know, it's been unprecedented with respect to the other candidate countries. So, what went wrong is mainly the question we will be asking. And as I said, I'm um, trying to, you know, uh, identify this kind of relationship as ghost relationship because uh, of the reasons I already mentioned. And so we'll be looking at the stalemate, the current stalemate. Now, what I'll be doing is, in about an hour, is to, uh, you know, sail you through a very short history. But we are not going to look at each and every event, of course, or each and every uh, single development in the course of the relations. We will be rather looking at uh, at the very important turning points, which in my view has culminated towards the current stalemate and current status of the deadlock in EU Turkey relations. Uh, I think we already mentioned the Rome Treaties. Uh, in, on the part of the European Union, it was the beginning, the official beginning of the European economic integration. Um, and two years after, as I said, Turkey was uh, uh, submitting this application after Greece. Because when you consider the Cold War years, and when you consider the conception of Turkey together with Greece by the Western world, especially the United States, Turkey wouldn't be able to stay outside an integration model or an integration process that Greece was in. So one of the main reasons why Turkey applies to the EU is because Greece had applied just one year before. Um, and then, you know, um, the association agreements were signed both with Greece in 1962 and 63, Turkey signed the association agreement. And what this agreement, we call it Ankara Agreement, uh, what this agreement envisaged was a three-stage integration um, which would culminate possibly in the 1990s with the completion of the customs union. So the article 28 of the Ankara Agreement was saying that if Turkey successfully completes the customs union, uh, it will, you know, uh, be considered uh, eligible for, for, for full membership. And this was how the journey started. Uh, on the Turkish side, you know, because what was expected was to lower the customs walls and to open up the market to the European uh, economic, you know, area. 
Um, Turkey started very enthusiastically to do this. Okay, there were um, all the governments, despite some uh, military interventions, short military interventions, all of the governments was very much eager that Turkey should complete the customs union requirements and be a full member to the European Union. This, this picture, you know, went very well. The 1960s were without any problems, but a major problem came in 1970s and early 1980s. And I think this is the first crucial turning point which um, shocked or which was damaging to the Turkey EU relations. The first point is regarding the accession of the UK um, to the European Union, uh, which changed, which was a game changer actually in the uh, ongoing relations. Um, do you have any idea why? Why do you think the uh, accession of the first enlargement of the European integration, the accession of UK, could be problematic for Turkey. You know, because what happened with the uh, accession of Europe, UK is the suspension of relations by Turkey uh, in 1978 um, on some grounds. Do you have an idea about what can be the reason? You know, yes. And if you can introduce yourself, I will be very happy. Uh, I'm Andrea. I'm Andrea. Andrea. Uh, maybe Cyprus. Exactly, Cyprus is one issue. What else? Do you think economically, on the economic front, and a very technical issue actually, which is not very much voiced? Maybe the British pound, I don't know. Um, okay, what about the terms that the UK became a member in 1973? The, the UK, as you might remember, uh, was vetoed twice by France, right, in the 1960s. And when it became a member in 1973, uh, it was able to push the, United, the European Union to sign some preferential trade agreements, which he had already had with the Commonwealth states, you know, which were previous colonies of the UK. So when these preferential trade agreements were signed in the 1970s, it was a total shock to Turkey. Why is that? Because the same products, the agricultural products, and Turkey was basically an agricultural country at that time, while Turkey was trying its best and hardship, in a hardship to lower the customs walls for the agricultural products and trying to, you know, um, make them competitive in the European market, all of a sudden, with the entry of the Commonwealth states and their agricultural products with a very lower, cheaper prices, hit Turkish economy. I mean, the uh, comparative advantage of Turkey was lost at that point, okay? And that, in addition to what Andrea said, uh, the Cyprus question was a very, very important impediment because Turkey, um, was considered by the European Union member states, the European Economic Committee, or I'll refer to it generally, the European Union, as an invader of Cyprus. And the problem was because of, uh, I just want to tell two uh, sentences about the essence of the Cyprus problem. When the ethnic atrocities started in Cyprus in the 1960s, Turkey had, as a guarantor state, wanted to, you know, intervene, uh, send its troops and intervene. It didn't happen in the 1960s because of the Johnson letter, which says that Turkey cannot use the NATO uh, military equipment or artillery in intervening in Cyprus, okay? Because they were afraid of the cold, you know, the Soviet intervention. So what happened is in 1974, when uh, the time was much ripe and the ethnic conflicts were continuing, Turkey decided to do this military intervention. In the first, there are two steps of that intervention. The first step, which took place in the July, the month of July, was in fact not a big problem because it was considered legally as a you know, uh, as an outcome of the guarantorship agreement, and not the United States, the UK, nobody said anything. But what the problem, uh, start, how the problem started was when uh, the, uh, 
Turkish military continued the uh, expansion uh, of the troops you know, in, in Cyprus uh, on some strategic grounds, of course, uh, while the Geneva talks was going on. So this is the crucial point which rendered Turkey, you know, as an invader in the eyes of the Europeans. So, in the 1970s, Turkey-EU relations came to a, you know, um, you know, came to a very, very problematic stage in 1978. The, uh, although Turkey had really uh, progressed a lot in the uh, lowering of the customs, union, customs walls, the center, lack of center government, by Egypt, who is the leader also of the military intervention in Cyprus, he suspended relations with the European Union. Now, I think this was a very, very, very critical decision because uh, it was exactly the same time in 1978 that Greece had applied for full membership. Okay, and I think this, if there, if there is a train which is missed on the part of Turkey to the European Union. This is exactly when Turkey so-called missed the train, in 1980 or 81. It was in 1981 uh, when Greece was accepted by the EU as a full member. Um, after a very short period of negotiations, very short, and Greece was having very important difficulties because they had emerged out of a military junta period, um, and they were fighting with their democratization problems, okay? Um, afterwards, we will see that with Spain and Portugal as well. But all these three Mediterranean enlargements are in fact strategic enlargements on the part of the European Union, not economically, you know, uh, beneficial uh, enlargements. Why am I saying this? Because there's an official commission report Commission Ami, we call it the opinion, which says that regarding Greece, uh, Greece actually is not really ready for full membership uh, because of structural economic reasons. So they, they propose to the Council a kind of transition period, a pre accession strategy to be prepared for Greece and then allow Greece as a full member. But the Council decision was completely strategically oriented and they just accepted Greece in. Uh, what was happening on Turkey? In Turkey at that time was very dramatic because uh, while Turkey realized in 1979 uh, and after the change of government from Egypt to another one, to a right-wing uh, central government, Turkey all of a sudden realized that, well, we are missing a train, you know, we, are, we have to really make our full membership application to the Euro European uh, integration because Greece will be accepted. So while the ministry was making all these preparations for the uh, application file, and this was actually promoted by the EU leaders at that time, we see that on 12th of September 1980, we have a major military coup, which, you know, devastated everything. It devastated Turkey-EU relations uh, seriously. Why am I saying this? Because uh, although the military coup and military uh, coup period, junta period, lasted for about three years, you may say it's not a long period of time, but the damage it had over Turkish democratic development was extensive, okay? Um, and one of the reasons why it was so extensive is because the military junta members uh, prepared a constitution, which is the 1982 constitution, which we are still trying to get rid of, you know, and we cannot get rid of it, because it had envisaged such a strong uh, executive in the Constitution that any government which comes into the rule after that period, they, previously they criticized the Constitution. 
But when they come to power, see how much power you know they acquire with that constitution, they, they don't they're not willing to change anything about that constitution. And this 1982 constitution is a milestone in my view, which damaged Turkey relations to a great extent because um, it envisaged, as I said, a very strong state uh, based on the arguments of the military that, you know, uh, the previous constitution, which is 1961 constitution, was the most liberal, was the most pro-civil society uh, constitution, which, according to the military, ended up with chaos, anarchy, and violence in the streets of Turkey. So what they did in 1980, uh, in the 82 constitution, is to bring back the state in a very strong form and decrease the powers and liberties of the civil society. Um, human rights issues was very, very problematic in the, in the constitution. So it's the spirit, what we call the spirit of the 1982 constitution, was completely against the spirit of the European integration. Okay? So, well, Turkey was left with this constitution and um, uh, you know, still striving to get rid of it, as I said. <coughs> but at the same time, in the 1980s, we, we, you know, the inclusion of Greece to the European uh, Union was um, was crucial, you know, in Turkey relations because Greece, uh, because of the Cyprus problem, started to veto each and every financial aid package to Turkey, okay? And this was very damaging for the preparations of the customs union on the part of Turkey because, uh, you know, the customs union process is a process where you need some financial aid from the European Union in order to uh, strengthen your sectors which are not able to compete with the European, in, in the European market, right? So Turkey was preparing on the one hand, continuing to prepare for the customs union, but at the same time was not able to receive any financial aid from the European Union because of the Cyprus problem and the veto of Greece. And this situation, of course, continued throughout the 1980s. Now here comes the next important turning point, which is the, 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 the late 1980s, early 1990s. What is the most important game changer in world politics, late 1980s? What happens in the world politics? And of the Cold War collapse of the Soviet Union. And it leaves us with, uh, I just want to go back to the map. Maybe I have another map. No. Okay, let's go back to the map. And you see that. Uh, the Central Eastern European uh, countries, which used to be left on a, behind the Aryan Curtain, so-called, now was free. You know, they were they became independent states, which are really longing for becoming a part of the European integration. So Turkey was there, trying to you know struggle with the 1982 Constitution, and still at the same time the bureaucrats were working hard to complete the customs union. Because the military junta didn't say that we should stop the process of European accession. I mean, they were pro-European Union. Um, so what happened is that in the in the late 1980s, when these countries, you know, seemingly uh, you could smell that you know the the atmosphere uh, that these Central European states would queue up, you know, in the in, in the games of in front of the games of, against of the European Union. Uh, we had a very interesting leader in Turkey called Turgut Özal. He was a liberal, conservative, uh, like a predecessor of Erdogan, you may call. Uh, he was very much pro-Western, but at the same time he was very coming from a conservative background. He said we should definitely prepare our application for full membership because we are going to miss the second train if we don't. Because he foresaw the fact that Turkey would be faced with a different map of Europe if they didn't really, if it didn't really 
really apply for the uh, accession process. So Turkey sent its application in 1987. It took two years <laughs> for the European uh, leaders to decide that, well, they don't really uh, want to accept Turkey's application. It was actually the Commission AVI again, the Commission opinion again, which says that, well, the European Union is now going to prepare itself for the single market, for the European Union, meaning Maastricht, and they were busy with the Single European Act and common foreign security policy, and you know all sorts of uh, preparations you may call for the upcoming uh, big wave, that tsunami wave that would come from Central Eastern Europe. So they said no to Turkey in 1989. It was a slap on the face for Turkey, and you know Turkey lost the uh, objective, you know, what, why, what are we doing? What are we preparing for? Why are we lowering our customs? These were the discussions in the uh, domestic front. But nevertheless, they continued to lower the customs union to open up the Turkish market to the European uh, goods and vice versa. So what happened is that in 1993, with the Treaty of Maastricht, Turkey was faced with a different, completely different uh, environment in, in Europe, you know. Um, now we have Copenhagen criteria, which says we have to fulfill the political criteria, you have to be, fulfill the economic criteria, you have to adopt the European Aki as a body, you know, many new things uh, on the way. Um, in the domestic front, it was seen uh, that, you know, as if the Europeans are changing the rules of the game when we are in the game, you know, and this is not fair. So, but nevertheless, you know, Europe was very concrete and, uh, and very uh, clear on that. The, the, any accession state would need to meet the criteria, Copenhagen criteria, right? And Turkey had extensive difficulties still striving or deriving from the uh, 1982 constitution uh, with the Kurdish problem, with the Cyprus problem, with the human rights problem, with the democratization problems, many, many problems uh, in different fronts. Um, but what happened uh, is that in the 1990s, in 1995 actually, Turkey was able to finish and complete the customs union. They signed an agreement between the European, uh, on the European part and Turkey, that you know, Turkey completed the customs union. So, what was expected in the domestic front, and you, would, you should have seen the newspaper titles, uh, headlines at that time, with the completion of the customs union, of course, people thought that we are in the European Union. Because that's what Ankara Agreement was saying. If you, are, if you complete the customs union, it's going to be fine. Uh, so you, you, you will see the politicians going around and saying that, well, we can go shopping now to Europe without any visa, we are now European citizens, we, you know, it's like, it was marketed like that to the Turkish public for a few months. But then the reality came as a shock, of course. Uh, in 1997, Luxembourg Council, the European Union didn't even list Turkey in the list of candidate countries, okay? And the reasons were obvious because of the human rights issue, because of the Kurdish problem, because of the uh, priority given to the Central Eastern European states. You know, Turkey was just not there. And this was again a shock. And uh, it created a, you know, each time these shocks were coming to Europe, to Turkey, uh, from the discourses and the decisions of the European Union institution, heads of institutions or the European leaders. Uh, it is very much deba debated you know, in the European public and European domestic arena at those years. Uh, so it, was, it turned Turkey uh, uh, to a shock stage because they said, well, two years ago we had completed the customs union, so what's wrong? with the European Union, why, do they, why don't they uh, still list Turkey as a candidate state? This situation was reversed 
two years later, which shows in a way the inconsistency on the part of the European Union as well, and this is how it's seen by Turkey. Uh, in 1999, this is a crucial, maybe the most uh, the most positive step uh, in the 1990s. The decision that Turkey can be eligible is a candidate country. So it's officially declared that Turkey is a candidate country, which was again a big uh, celebration on the part of Turkey because now Turkey could be eligible for funds, could be uh, able to participate in the exchange programs. Many, many uh, new uh, arena, arenas of cooperation was opened. Um, so when we come to the new century, okay, the, the, the most important, uh, I would say, the last 20 years, um, things changed considerably and very quickly. Uh, and you, you may, you, I mean, as scholars of Europe, European uh, integration, as those, as being one of those who is uh, studying the course of this history, you would be amazed about the ups and downs in the relationship. It's like a cyclical relationship, and it's, you know, uh, it's not changing over the years. It's amazing to see this. So another cycle, another negative cycle came. Um, just four or five years later, uh, when the European Union start, you know, um, uh, declared the candidacy status. With the candidacy status in 1999, they also said, you have to prepare for the accession negotiations, and to do that, opening of the accession negotiations, and to do that you have to fulfill the rest of the political criteria, you have to change most parts of the 1982 constitution. The most important problem uh, touched upon in the progress reports prepared yearly by the Commission was the civil military relations. Is that this role of the military in Turkish politics has definitely to be changed. Okay? And we see that in, 19, in 2002, okay, because of the domestic change, political change, we see this Justice and Development Party appearing in the domestic scene of Turkey with a great victory, uh, unprecedented, um, a party which calls itself as a conservative democrat, but when you look at inside, it's like politically Islamist, religiously oriented party. So, a more moderate, but still having religious tones. Um, and that was the party which really suffered a lot from the secular uh, military's interventions, because those political Islamists were always the target of the, uh, I would say, uh, the secular elite and also the military. So, when they came to power in, the, in 2002, and this is a critical year because Turkey is deadly preparing to change the 1982 constitution. It started before the Justice and Development Party came to power, but it continued in a, in a you know, unprecedented pace because the parliament was working day and night trying to change the constitution, you know, the problematic uh, aspects of the 1982 constitution, they were able to change, um, I can't remember the exact number, but more than uh, around 100 uh, articles and subtitles of the constitution in big eight harmonization packages, as we call it. So they all passed through the parliament rapidly. Uh, the criticism, what is crucial here is that the criticisms of the European Union with regard to civil-military relations and with regard to the oppression of the state by the 1982 constitution was very much welcomed by this new party, a Justice Development Party at the beginning. Okay? When you look at the initial five, six years of your Justice and Development Party under Erdogan, uh, they embrace the European values, they are so Europhile, and they say that European Union is a completely right. You know, look at the mess created by this military. Why is that? Because military was their main enemy, you know, in 
the domestic arena. Uh, and I was writing an article about that period and I, when I was amazed to see that uh, the, the proposals that the Justice and Development Party put to Parliament uh, with regard to the change of the role of Turkish military, I remember there were 35 points, you know, bullet points. Um, people thought that this was basically originated from the will of Justice and Development Party to democratize, right? But when you look at those 35 points and compare them with the progress reports by the European Union, they exactly match. Okay, so this was basically the words of the European Union which was marketed to the domestic audience as the proposal of the Justice and Development Party. So people, the supporters of the party, thought that, you know, have a nice party, well, we are going to liberate. The oppression on the Islamists will end, the military will disappear, um, the death penalty will be abolished. What a nice, you know, uh, process. The situation continued and these changes happened uh, until 19, 2004 when the European Union said in the Brussels summit, okay, you fulfilled the political criteria, which in my view was a very wrong decision because, um, because the European Union didn't wait to see whether the civilianization of the, uh, military, civil military relations would lead to democratization of civil military relations. These are two different concepts, and we can uh, deal with it when you, if you have any questions. So, civilization of politics, this is, I think, very crucial to understand the present status of Turkey. Civilianization of politics didn't mean democratization of politics. Because the military's authority and, you know, uh, powers somehow in time was gradually grasped by the ruling authority. And we will talk about it in a minute. So what happened in 2004, Turkey's was, Turkey couldn't believe in its ears because the, the European Union is saying, we can start the accession negotiations in 2005, right? But when you look at the ground, there are still many problems with regard to democratization, with regard to you know, closure of political parties, still you know, problems with regard to the functioning of customs union, etc. But the, union, union, the European Union said, OK, it's fine. We can start. So the, start, the accession negotiations start in 2005, OK, 3rd of, uh, 3rd of October. But what happens, again, is another cycle which comes and follows this um, huge celebration in Turkey. And it was so funny because I was in Ankara at that time and they were trying to make fireworks during the day. You know, the, this uh, pro-Islamist uh, municipal leader was out of his mind. He said, well, we are now almost in the European Union, look, we have started the accession negotiations, we will just finish the process in a few years, and we are there. And there were fireworks in the, in, during the day. So that was the enthusiasm, which was followed with another big, 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 big shock, which was the accession of the big men in, or what you call the Central Eastern European states, okay? So the 2004 enlargement, was the last shock of the European Union towards Turkey because um, Turkey actually couldn't grasp the fact that the European Union is going to be a union which is completely different, which will be completely different. Uh, Europe was close to, on, in, uh, to its own agenda, trying to prepare a constitution, a draft constitution on the one hand, but at the same time trying to absorb, you know, the standing member states, which came out of the uh, 2004 enlargement. So when you look at the <coughs> side of the European Union, you see that they don't have Turkey on their agenda, right, after 2004, because they are talking the Commission documents officially are saying that 
we have enlarged, and this was too much. We, there is an absorption capacity you have to consider. There is an enlargement fatigue you have to consider. And these two concepts were, of course, perceived from Turkey, uh, again, with a shock, because they said, what, what the hell, you know, they, they were just starting the accession negotiations two years before, and now they are saying that they are, they are tired of enlargement. So what are we working for? What are we striving for? They are not going to make us a full member anyway. And this was the stage, uh, what I call the second stage of the Justice Development Party period, where Turkey's public opinion, as well as the political elite's opinion, turned very much Eurocentric, okay? Both on the right and on the left. So the European Union started to become like a ghost, really. All the agendas of the party programs of political leaders, political uh, parties, discourses of political leaders, you know, daily running of the state, no references whatsoever to European Union. But we should make a difference between being Euroskeptic and anti-European. At that time, Euroscepticism was much more, you know, there. They were silent about, I mean, they were not really criticizing a lot, but they were silent and they stopped, you know, they, they said, what, what's going on? You know, why, why, why is this happening? What is uh, worse and what is furthermore worse is that the discourses, the mixed signals coming from the European Union, both from institutions, but at the same time from the leaders, like Merkel, like Sarkozy, were so badly received by Turkey, um, who were talking about the fact that Turkey can never be a full member, Turkey can only be a privileged partner, or a strategic partner, or a Mediterranean partner, Partnership was the issue, you know, it was not membership any longer. So you would imagine that uh, at the same time, when they start, when the European leaders started to criticize uh, the rise of some uh, practices of political Islam, contrary to secularism in Turkey, now this was the point which diverged the ways of Turkey and the European Union. Am I good with the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So everyone realized that, well, the European Union is not going to be supporting us any longer because they, are, they have become critical of both the enlargement and also they have become critical of the political Islam, the ideology of that party and the ruler uh, and the leader. So, and this was, in, there was a point in that because we see that the discourses, and I have written about this, so there are concrete examples of the discourses used by the political leaders, and you know as students of IR, uh, the discourses are not ordinary statements. You know. They are made on purpose, they have a power, we call them speech acts, you know, because they are converted to action as well. So we see that what the European Union tried and started to adopt in the uh, first decade of the 2000s is that what we may call as civilizational discourses. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Do you have an idea? When I say the European leaders started to use civilizational discourses, references to the civilizations, what, what might they referring to, refer to? Yes. Exactly, exactly. What else do you think with regard to geography, with regard to religion, with regard to, you know, uh, the culture of uh, Turkey? So we see that, and this is a very interesting turn in European uh, Union's discourses. We see that after 2007, 6 or 7, the discourses of European leaders, as well as the institutions, have become uh, civilizationally oriented, which means that there is a reference to the fact that Turkey is too big, too poor, too Muslim, and even geographically it's not a part of Europe.
okay? Which, uh, you know, Turkey didn't change its geography, of course. It was there back in the 1950s, in the 60s. It was still poor, it was still Muslim. Majority of the population was Muslim. Um, so this discourse, you can imagine the impact which is created as a mirror on the Turkish political front. And there was Erdogan, you know, who made an excellent use from his perspective of these discourses to foster, to, uh, to boost the, to, to the pro-Islamist uh, voters to get votes. So we see that this anti-Turkish sentiment on the part of Europe has created a mirror image in Turkey with anti-Europeanism starting from 2007 onwards. And this is exactly where uh, both sides started to diverge like this, okay? Like completely opposite. And we don't see a very uh, significant positive agenda since then. Uh, and it's a pity because uh, Normally, the bureaucrats who are working on both sides are, there are bureaucrats who are still Europhile in Turkey. Uh, I don't know very much what happens in the European side, but when you look at it from a technical perspective, uh, although Turkey had difficulties in many fronts, economically, uh, they argue that you know it had really done well. It, it had done its best to complete the customs union, to enter to customs union without taking part in the decision making mechanism. It was a very crucial decision, you know, and the government of that time was criticized very heavily. They said, well, the opponents say, why are we entering the customs union when we are not able to do the decisions? Uh, to you know, if. For instance, if the European Union is signing an agreement with China, the Turkey is a part of it, but it cannot enter the decision-making process, you see. It's a very strange uh, situation. Um, so since 2007, uh, as I said, this anti-Europeanism anti rising in Turkey, and it's very obvious in the statements of Erdogan. I have recently published a piece, a book chapter on how the discourses of Erdogan has shifted from Europhilism to anti-Europeanism. Uh, it's very obvious, okay? And you see that um, uh, exactly in the <coughs> On both sides, the way this diverging path is completely uh, rendered, has completely rendered both sides introverted uh, in time. When you look at the part of European Union, European Union is very busy with the, uh, you know, uh, changes, the, the changes with the, which came with the Lisbon Treaty. Because now, you know, for many decisions we have to involve the national parliaments. Uh, as the number has increased in, uh, with the enlargement of 2004, the decision making has changed to some extent. But at the same time, there is a drift away from neo functionalism and federalism. I think this is a very, very, very important. I would like to hear your views on that. Um, the European Union is also not the same European Union of the 1950s, okay? They have become now more, uh, they have brought the states, the national states back to the agenda again. So there's a question of whether the European Union is drifting towards federalism, or again, you know, the national sovereignties and national interests are getting back on the agenda. And this, this influences Turkey a lot because the more the European Union moves towards federalism, which means that it is going to be integrated more, hopefully, in the, on the grounds of more technical, more, uh, I would say, constitutional aspects, which would be more positive for Turkey. We can open it up in the QA, QA. Uh, What happened in the following years in Turkey and the last decade is of course, as you, many of you might be following, it's, it's problematic in Turkey. It's, it's getting more and more problematic as Turkey is drifting away from uh, democratic practices. 
uh, it has changed the uh, you know political uh, system from parliamentary democracy to a, a so-called presidential system, but we don't know if there's any other example which is resembles to, so it's unique uh, presidential system where the powers of the president cannot be controlled. There are no checks and balances in the system. There is a very obsolete parliament working, but the main decision maker is the sole authority of Erdogan. Uh, and of course, in the last decade, there were some test cases, some litmus tests, which could maybe, maybe bring Turkey and European Union together again. There are three important uh, events, or three important cases, and then I'll finish it. Uh, the first one was, you probably know, I mean, you all remember that this was because of the war on Syria, the refugee crisis was extensive, and migration crisis was very, very important. Uh, many scholars said, well, this can open up an opportunity for collaboration between EU and Turkey because the European Union didn't want these refugees. They want Turkey, they wanted Turkey to keep these migrants in Turkey, and in return, there was what they called this EU Turkey deal. Uh, in return of three, 3 billion euros, I think, something like that. But that backfired because uh, it didn't work on both sides. In Turkey, it was criticized heavily uh, with the arguments that, oh, are you selling these migrants? You know, what's the price of a migrant? It's, it's, it, the deal was not welcomed at all. And on the European uh, side, I think it was the same. It was both, uh, it didn't really, they work very well on both sides and created resentment on the contrary. Uh, the second important turning point is the Gezi Park events in Turkey in 2013 when we had a group of activists who, who gathered in Istanbul, Taksim Square, to oppose the uh, conversion of a park, which is called Gezi Park, to a uh, to a shopping mall. But this movement became a symbol of a movement which is anti, uh, anti authoritarianism, anti Erdoganism. So that was crushed by the, by the police forces in a uh, very harsh manner. And those who were, um, you know, there were, there were intellectuals, journalists, who were accused of engaging in a coup plot. Uh, through the Gezi Park events against the, uh, against the regime. And Gezi Park events was very crucial because the European Union voiced its discontent and criticism towards Turkey, saying that the use of force is not uh, in uh, proportion. And the fact that there are civil uh, intellectuals, journalists, you know, uh, students, killed or arrested during that protest is against the human rights, etc. So that was a big blow uh, on the part of the Erdogan. We see that uh, President Erdogan is uh, using statements which are extremely anti-European, which says that those countries who consider the supporters of Gezi Park events are my enemies. You know, they are not really they, they're not really friends of Turkey. They are really trying to change uh, or support the protesters who are trying to change the regime. So Gezi Park events is another turning point which makes things even worse between EU and Turkey. Um, and the last turning point is actually the not 2016 failed coup attempt. Uh, it's very hard to explain the nature of the coup attempt, but this is, simply put, it can be said like uh, it was a fraction of the political Islamists who had uh, sneaked into the state posts uh, to grasp the power of the state and overthrow Erdogan's government. So it was like a within state uh, coup. But that was very much shocking to Erdogan because 
After that, we see that uh, it's the same arguments that Erdogan is using against the European Union because many, many uh, members of the terrorist organization called FETÖ, the FETÖ terrorist organization, FETÖ is the name of the leader, uh, a preacher actually, who is uh, uh, regarded as the main leader of that terrorist group. Uh, those who fled to Europe and those who are not really uh, returned back to Turkey are very much problematic, have been very much problematic by Erdogan because he said well, many, many European states are embracing those terrorists and they cannot be a European Union we want to join. So there is this harsh, there are even harsher statements uh, which are directed towards the European regimes, how hypocritical the European regimes are, how on the one hand they are um, pro-democratic, but on the other hand they are embracing and nesting these terrorists. But from the European perspective, what was problematic was the broad and vague definition of terrorism. So they said, you know, how, how can you define terrorism? Was a big problem. Okay, this is, uh, these are the newspaper excerpts you can see where the original agreement was signed. And this is the caricature I like very much, which depicts Turkey. Uh, <laughs> not being able to reach the European Union, but what is important and interesting, when I was telling you about the civilizational references, you look at the Turkish guy. The Turkish guy is with a moustache, and actually he is in a typical Ottoman cloth. He is not a Turkish citizen. So it is a depiction from how the European caricatures, and there are many, many thousands of caricatures like that. Um, I, uh, I was able to obtain a four volume like this stick of caricatures of European caricaturists about Turkey and uh, in each and every one of them the Turkish men are depicted as such which is really not reflecting the, the truth of the other. I mean, there are, there are no, there is nobody in Turkey who is still wearing a pants. Okay. There are religious clothes, there are people who from time to time can use religious clothing, but this is not really um, a real picture. <coughs> okay, so um, we can say that uh, because the, I think we mentioned most of them, because the main question at the beginning was, how does Turkey see Europe? How is Europe seen from outside? And this is the rationale of this whole series of region, region Europe. Uh, Turkey sees Europe in a very uh, mixed state. You know, they, they think that there's not one voice coming from Turkey, from Europe. There are pro-Turkish countries from time to time. There are anti-Turkish countries from time to time. But generally, the perception is anti-Turkish. That's what the Turkish uh, public opinion uh, perceives. And also, with regard to these three important crises, you know, migration, Gezi Park, and failed coup attempt, we see that the, from the Turkish perspective, especially from the perspective of the Turkish elites, the governing elite, they think that Tur the Europeans were uh, people you know, they were not really doing what they promised uh, and they were very much this is a picture which is very much debated in Turkish uh, political uh, analysts because you see how uh, it also it shows uh, how during the migration crisis Germany was valuing you know Erdogan despite all this trend towards authoritarianism, democratic backsliding. So the secular, modern, westernized, educated elite was saying that what's the European Union doing? You know? How can you support a leader which is acting so anti-democratically towards these people? Um, the question, the answer was of course the migration deal, you know, because Europe needed Turkey for um, for the migration crisis. 
Um, now, coming to the end, what I think, what my perspective is that I think it's the. I don't want to end with a pessimistic note because I know I was telling you, Giovanni that we always make jokes among each other the scholars of European integration. We we always say we are having a mid carrier crisis because it's the relations are not going anywhere, and those of us who are working on these relations are really stuck with the uh, with the process. And unfortunately, the trend is that. In Turkey, uh, we used to have European Union classes, Jaguar chairs, you know, um, many courses on European Union. Now we have again published a piece with my colleagues. Uh, we covered 180 universities and the Department of International Relations and the courses on the European Union. The numbers of the open courses on EU are decreasing considerably. The interest of the students on the EU affairs is interestingly increasing. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's not a good thing because if you think that these relations might get back on track one day, it means that we're not really going to be ready because we won't be educating the manpower which is going to be necessary in that stage. So the teaching and education of European uh, studies in Turkey is very much linked to what's going on in politics. And this is, I think, a very interesting observation. On the part of the European Union, I think it's very much uh, up to the Europeans to decide what kind of European Union they want. Do they want a Europe like a fortress where, you know, they really have their boundaries and the others are excluded, uh, but at the same time, on the other part of the frontiers, on the other part of the castles, of walls of the castle, there are, you know, excluded enemies, or would they be open, as was the idea in the beginning, to like a cosmopolitan unity in diversity idea to embrace both the neighbors, maybe the accession countries, and, and uh, the others. So it all depends on how the Europeans see the future for themselves. And I think the present theories of enlargement uh, in the literature are unable to explain the relations between Turkey and EU any longer. Because they have really gone off track and it has been such a long period of time that we need a new theory of enlargement, definitely, to explain and to find ways out of this stalemate and to find a solution to this uh, end. Um, yes. And I want to... I was always thinking that maybe one of the ways out on the part of Europe might be to go back to and revisit the ideas of neo-functionalism again. When those states who used to be warring each other for so many centuries could come together uh, and create this European project and live in peace and prosperity considered considerably, I mean, compared to the other parts of the world. Of course there are problems I know, but still there are no wars, and this is a big luxury, you know, to be able to live in peace. Um, so this neo-functionalism, the revision of revisiting of neo-functionalism might be a way out, uh, I think. And I want to conclude by referring to Jean Monnet, and you probably know his name. I like his uh, excerpt very much. He says, make men work together, show them that beyond their differences and geographical boundaries, there lies a common interest. So uh, this is a motto probably both sides, European Union and Turkey, should be revisiting and rethinking. And I want to just finish by this optimistic note. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, so <clears throat> now me and Jia are ready. Thank you very much, Irene, for your talk, for your lecture. And me and Jia are ready uh, to run with the microphone for your uh, questions, uh, remarks, uh, and uh, comments, uh, and so on. Okay, so the floor is open. Yes, 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 please. If you feel like you uh, have points which is not clear to you in the course of the presentation, please feel free to ask me. I wonder if any of you has visited Turkey. Have you traveled to Turkey before? No? No one? One, two, three. Okay, okay. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know. As I said, it's very much depending on the conjuncture. Because we have an MOU and an RCC agreement with the University of Torino and in my university, thanks to Giovanni. So, in the past, we had students who came and did research actually in, in Turkey, and I wish I reminded you all if you would like to come and spend a semester or a year in Turkey, it would be more than welcome. Our city is the most, the best city. Turkey put it, we have to save money, it's much more. And the food is excellent. The food is excellent, exactly. <laughs> so if you are interested, you have my email in the presentation, or you can ask Giovanni and you can send Yes, that's the situation. That's the situation. Yes, so I think that uh, you have many questions on your tongue, for example, you know, the meeting between, the wonderful meeting between Erdogan and, yes, that is right.
Uh, okay, let me answer it. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> Turkish policy towards Greece is, uh, let's put it this way, Turkish foreign policy in general since the last decade is very much based on securitization and militarization. This is something new, and you know you must be following all the domestic uh, manufacturing of these uh, planes with, without man, what I don't know the name, technical name of it, the aircrafts without man. They are, I mean, Turkey is producing them and like, exporting it to you know, many countries in the region. Drones. Drones, etc. Um, but I must say this, you know, I think it's true for both sides that each time there is an election, domestic election, uh, foreign policy, in, in the case of Greece, Turkey's hostility towards Greece argument, and in Turkey, you know, Greeks' occupation of the islands, whatever, and such an issue, becomes the theme of these, especially populist leaders, okay? So, uh, but what happens in reality uh, is mm, both sides cannot afford, you know, as both being NATO members, they cannot afford to get engaged in a war or in a conflict. It's not possible, in my view. Uh, there are daily, on a daily basis, there are uh, uh, clashes of war, especially in the Aegean. Uh, not on the surface, but in the Aegean. Uh, I was talking to a military uh, general uh, before I came here. He's, he's saying that well, this is like a daily practice that we, you know, we chase their aircrafts and they chase our boats in the Aegean, uh, you know, when they're there in the territorial waters or in the continental shelf or international waters. It's like a daily uh, routine, I would say. When you talk and when you observe it, but what I um, what I think is that from time to time, especially Greece realizes the potential of the Turks who would like to go and visit, especially the Aegean Islands, and to promote tourism. And very lately, you know, just two weeks ago, I think they had. Uh, lifted, you know, the, shame, the, the visa for the Turks to promote their coming uh, to these islands, if I'm not wrong, uh, to, to be able to foster their economic development. So, security issues, in my perspective, in my reading, is only marketed, securitized, whereas both sides cannot really afford to get engaged in an actual conflict. Uh, it's not realistic, really. And I'm really uh, surprised to see scholars, I have many friends in Greece, many scholars, um, who are still uh, sometimes talking about the fact that Turkey can invade South Greece or some troops to Greece. It's not possible, you know, it's not, it's not going to ever happen. They can send troops to Syria, to Iraq, but never to Greece, because that geography cannot afford to a kind of conflict that could trigger the inter intervention of uh, further intervention of Russia and US. So it's not a sound question, in my view. The domestic politics in Turkey, uh, well, you, you must be following what's going on. It's, um, you know, the elections in May was uh, a major turning point because uh, the opposition had made a great effort and was very hopeful, you know, that the this the Walter's decision will be converted to a more to the pro pro opposition party to topple the Erdogan, but it didn't materialize. Of course, the situation is getting, in my view, a bit problematic because the there is this huge media control uh, of the Erdogan regime. Uh, which is basically affecting the way they, that, that the party and the leader is getting votes from. Economically, the situation is very delicate because the inflation, the official inflation is told to be around 100%, uh, which is not probably going to be sustainable, and the economic elite 
there's this new uh, minister for uh, economy. Uh, he's traveling around in the uh, you know, Gulf states, in uh, London, in some major European capitals to look for some kind of uh, opportunities of investment in Turkey or to bring some hot money, as they call it, you know, to the Turkish economy. Um, but it's not sustainable. It's, I don't know where, uh, where, where it will hit the rock, but uh, the situation is very delicate with that high inflation. The most intriguing and the most shocking outcome is that the people do not react. They are very much, uh, I think it's um, what we may call like people are getting more and more anti-politics, anti-politicized. You know, they are they are feeling powerless, and they are just watching the political game between you know these uh, different leaders who are stuck with their chairs, I would say. So it's not. I mean, democratically, it's, uh, it's very problematic. The European Union is not at all on the agenda of Turkey, and I was surprised, very surprised, to see that. When the war on Ukraine, the Russia's war on Ukraine started, I was expecting that <coughs> the European uh, head of the European Parliament or Commission, Ursula von um, der Myers, might contact Erdogan uh, because Erdogan was longing for, seeking to play an important role in, especially this brain issue, the trade issue. But uh, in any of the documents of the Commission or the institutions of the EU, you see no reference to Turkey. Turkey is not there, you know. Despite the geographical relevance, I'm not saying importance, but relevance to the uh, Ukrainian, you know, the, the, the geography. So for the European leaders, it's obvious that the present regime is not reliable. They don't want to have any kind of links with probably the Erdogan regime because there is no effort for a positive agenda as well. And those who are um, more secular, western-oriented, educated elites in Turkey, they are criticizing also the European Union, saying that, well, why is the European Union not opening at least the chapters, the opening the accession negotiation chapters on, let's say, rule of law, on human rights, which could, you know, somehow put some pressure on the government or, you know, they should find a way out. But I think it's a stage where none of the parties would like to consider a relationship. It's they just want to keep on with the stalemate uh, as it happens from time to time. Yes, there was a question over there. Yeah. Hi, I'm Manuel, I'm studying here in Turing China Global Studies. And thank you for your presentation, it was really interesting. And my question is like, from my understanding, uh, as Erdogan is turning even more uh, hostile to the European Union, even the opposition, even the people of the six, didn't produce a pro European position at the last elections. So my question is, there is an actual uh, pro-European political party or political forces that actually support integration? Well, in the last elections, the, the opposition, the main opposition party, was talking about the fact that if they get elected, they would uh, get the relations back on rail. But how would they do it? They don't do it. Maybe if they had, I was criticizing that, if they had given a clear uh, explanation of what they meant by that, both to the European Union and to the Turkish audience, it could have created some result. But this discourse, on the other hand, was opposed by the discourse of the ruling party, which was, you know, from all the media channels, they are making this anti-propaganda, saying that, you know, what kind of Europe are you trying to join? Look at Europe. Europe is out of its uh, universal values. Look at how they dealt with migration issue. Look at how they embrace terrorists. Uh, how they are hypocritical, 
the adjective of hypocritical is used so much in uh, the discourses of the ruling party and also by Erdogan. So, uh, as I said, the opposition party has some references to the to bring the relations back uh, on rail, but it didn't prove any results because there was not uh, it was not backed by concrete evidence and how they would do that. Um, so unfortunately, you know, at the present, no, no reference. Yes, there is one. <coughs> Hi, uh, I'm Kulash from Izmir Turkey. Ah, and you didn't mention that you were. <laughs> which, which part of Izmir? Cheshma. 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 I was wondering your uh, opinions as a Turkish citizen. Uh, from the beginning to the end, uh, what were your trying to do? Actually, they were. What they, were? Uh, what, were, what were they trying to do? Like, they, they were even going to accept her to the. Uh, Europe, or they were trying just uh, trying to find ex excuses, or were they just trying to change Turkey, like a little modern uh, European country, like a modern European country? What were they, what were they trying to do? Okay, I think it's an excellent question uh, because I wanted to open it up when I was talking, but I couldn't do it. I think they are not doing something specifically designed for Turkey. Okay. They're not sitting down and saying, well, how can we develop policies to alienate Turkey and to keep it outside? I don't think this is the point. The point is, the Turkish leaders, the Turkish intellectuals, sometimes even scholars, do not understand that the European integration is a living uh, organism. It's like a living organism. It's enlarging. It's deepening, it's changing, it's maturing, sometimes it's not maturing. Uh, but you have to have skilled politicians to be able to read carefully what's the European Union doing. We miss it in Turkey. I think what the European Union is trying to do is, of course, um, uh, to have the necessary steps to its for its own survival, you know. Um, the stages that I was talking about, the enlargement stages, they were not specifically designed to alienate Turkey, but we should, we should be fair that Turkey also had problems uh, domestically, as I mentioned the 1982 constitution especially. But on the, on the, the, the most important paradox and what is uh, misread and which doesn't give a right signal to the uh, accession countries on the part of the European Union is this. They are deepening, they are changing their treaties, for instance the Treaty of Lisbon, if you read it carefully, uh, you see the importance of the national, national level coming back to the decision making. Okay? Now, this might look like a very simple legal change, but it has so much important political repercussions. Because uh, they have done this because this is something created out of the dynamics of the European integration. Okay? Because the constitution was rejected, the move towards federalism was questioned, whether it's the right time or not, you know, the Dutch and French refused the constitution. So the Lisbon Treaty, was the second best, best option, was talking about the fact that the national sovereignties matter. Okay? Uh, and I think this was a decision not made specifically for Turkey, but it has direct implications for Turkey. Because I always tell my students that it's not sufficient now for the Turks to understand the dynamics of European integration. In addition, you have to know very well the domestic politics of Lithuania, Latvia, France, Germany, Italy, Czech Republic, you know, Poland. You have to know every detail of the domestic 
politics of these member states because now their parliaments matter in the decision of enlargement. Okay? So what I think is that the European Union has always made enlargement decisions mostly out of strategic reasons. Uh, not when we look at the first, second, third, uh, the big bang enlargement. They are not driven exactly by economic motives. Okay, so they are thinking about their survival, strategic interests, uh, and to make this acceptable to the European public as well. This is where I think Turkey doesn't really read carefully what's going on in European Union. So this perception that Europe is against us and is doing everything to exclude us is not also a realistic ass assessment in my view. Because, uh, uh, but, but what Turkey could do is to reel back the relations to the technical and uh, I would say economic or non-political spheres, which is not, it's not doing that. Because everything is at the political level, it got into a stalemate. And this is exactly what Jean Monnet was talking about, that you know, in the course of integration or in the course of um, creating a union, what matters is first the functional cooperation, right? So Turkey was not successful on its part to convert the economic uh, relations, the, the trade relations, as a success to the political front because there was no will on the part of Turkish leaders most of the time. It's the same in, Tur in, in the European Union because from the European perspective they are thinking that well, if Turkey is a full member then it means that it's going to be the second, uh, after Germany I guess, the second largest country which will be represented in the council in the uh, parliament whatever. I mean, the decision making will be affected by Turkey's full membership. I remember very well there was Oli Rehn, uh, once upon a time, uh, commissioner for enlargement, who had made a speech in Turkey. He said, he said, he was a very pro Turkish and uh, you know, he, he liked Turkey very much. And he said, I remember very correctly, he said, there is no reason why, uh, this was back in the 1990s, there is no reason why Turkey cannot be a full member because we have assessed the Central and Eastern European countries also not on the basis of economic uh, interests. It was a strategic decision and Turkey matters to the EU strategically. But, he said, but, he said, we have to definitely uh, visit, revisit and revise our institutional setup to be able to balance you know, these huge populations representation in the EU institutions. So you see the concerns, you know. Um, I don't know if it was a question, if it was an answer to a question, if it was a long answer, but I don't think that uh, things should be assessed in uh, cultural, civilizational, non-technical ways. There are many technical obstacles which are not even known or voiced out by, the, by both sides. Okay, so thank you very much. I think our time is over. However, however, we have the unique chance to ask the professor to make a question of the question. The question, and then can have a So I want an answer, but no. So why did Erdogan give the seat to uh, Charles Michel and not to the Bustle of the Line and then they lost a meeting? Good question, I will ask you. I'm not in his mind. No, is, it, is this machism? Or the lack of knowledge of the European I think, Union? I think it's, it's uh, machoism at the beginning, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Ursula, the, the discourses of Ursula was very much visible in Turkey, anti-Turkish discourses. Discourses matter 
my dear friends. I mean, the, the, the discourses of the politicians matter a lot because, especially in that, this age of communication, every single word of each and every politician is public. Okay? So, Ursula, there's a, there's a general anti feeling against it. And I think that's why uh, Erdogan was not trying to look sympathetic towards her and rather. But that's not something which is quite heavy. Okay.